from the Multimedia Library of the Alliance Francaise de Nairobi. This is Mbogi Ya Maraitas. Welcome. Soyez les bienvenus. In this edition, the focus is on the Constitution of Kenya 2020, whose 11th anniversary fell on the 27th of August. We have a panel of three. At one end, representing our youth, is Immaculate Were, a student of law who recently won a prize in an essay writing competition on human rights. At the other end is Christine Nkonge, the executive director of the Katiba Institute, the constitutional watchdog body which organized the competition. And the man beside me is our guest author, Irungu Houghton, Executive Director, Amnesty International Kenya, who has written the book which we're about to discuss, Dialogue and Dissent. Now, Irungu, if I may, since we're good friends, I'll put it to you that the three of us have read your book, but in your own words, what's it all about? Well, Dialogue and Dissent, um, a Constitution in Search of a Country is a, I guess, a biography of our Constitution. And what it is, essentially, is the story of the last 10 years of what it's been like to have a new Constitution and what has actually kept that Constitution um, going over these 10 years. So I, I've written it, essentially, to capture this moment, which I think is a historical moment. I was particularly interested in doing two things. One is uh, to demonstrate that among us are people and stories or tales that will be legends one day. And I hope anybody who reads that will pick from the pages um, the experiences of a number of personalities that we should all know. Thank you. Well, a bit of a taster of what to expect from the foreword, written by the former Chief Justice of Kenya, Dr. Willy Mutunga. Dialogue and dissent will appeal to all who are grappling with hopelessness or resignation that their societies are not moving toward just, non-militaristic, non-racist, non-ethnic, democratic, equitable, and ecologically safe nations. It will also appeal to those who want to understand how flashpoints of activism are constructed by citizens and civic organizations. That's my segue, if you wish, for the conversation that could involve us all. Because when I was a little boy, we used to do something in school called civics. And uh, civics was where you sort of worked out the executive, the judiciary, the legislature. My preoccupation, grounded on your book for discussion, is how we can move to this whole idea of civic education, educating our societies to be better placed to understand their rights. And I'm going to start off with the young person. Civic education, what was your reaction to this book when you read it? Did you know everything that Irungu had to say, or was it a steep learning curve? I must admit that I knew some things. Obviously, I'm a lawyer, so I would be lying to all of you if I told you that I was bamboozled or I didn't know anything that is in this book. But the part of the story that I found more interesting is telling the stories of activists. I think um, as a society, we have made activists look like robots or people who are not human or who don't have personal stories. So for me, besides just being told about the law, I appreciated being told about the stories of those who have brought us to this moment and the stories of those who gave us the new constitution that we had today. Yeah. Christine, your reactions to the book. Okay. To me, the most interesting thing about this book was the realization that Kenyans know their rights. So it is more about how do I actualize those rights? How do I actually implement them in practice? So the stories in this book actually come from a point of hesitation first, um, what do I do? Then taking a bit of courage, asking others who've done it before, and then actually doing something that can be called a civic duty. 
and actually doing it successfully and repeatedly for some. Right. We're still going to go back to this idea of educating the masses. Why isn't this book a set book in our national curriculum? Why does it fall to the individual to write a book like this to be sold in bookshops? That's what con seems to concern me. Why would you say? So, okay, as, as you know, some of these stories are not stories that you'll find in an academic text. Academic text uh, gives you the bare responsibilities of you and the state and the responsibilities to you, uh, that you have as a person to your country and your leadership uh, through your government has to you. And so they are a bit dry and not always contextualized in real life situations. So a book like this is helpful to even take somebody who's in a classroom setting to put whatever they read on paper into practice. It actually says a situation whereby you might need to exercise your right to be deemed to be innocent until proven guilty, and actually does that in a real life situation that could have been reported in the media, they could have read on Twitter or on Instagram or whatever. So the actual um, process of internalizing from uh, the bare pages of our constitution to actually the lived experience every single day, that is not, it's not something you find in an academic book. I'm going to sort of keep on grinding on this particular pillow a bit more. Yeah. The question of dissemination. It was Immaculate who said she wouldn't be bamboozled if um, she sees she's a lawyer, she knows all about this. We're always talking about Amina, Wanjiko, Atieno. Uh, our interest, particularly given what we're celebrating about the Constitution now, mm -hmm. is how do we spread? Are we deleting Wanjiko, Atieno, Amina from the conversation because they, are, they can't understand? Mm -hmm. They'll never get it? Irungu? No, absolutely not. I mean, the book uh, is simply written. It's written in a format that I think most people can read if they read in English. Uh, that's the first thing. There is no Kiswahili version of this book, but um, it is a book that's fairly simple to read. I was very deliberately uh, cautioned against uh, writing a, um, a PhD or a, a master's uh, thesis, but it does operate on, on several levels, right? So it operates, uh, it talks a little bit about the history of constitution. So without being a lawyer, you can understand the history of constitutionalism, how our constitutions are Right, written. I'm going to be unfair on you. Would you, mm -hmm. do you have the wherewithal to have written this book in Kiswahili? You, Irungu Houghton. I didn't choose to do that. That was not my choice. Right. So, um, but I would be very happy for somebody to translate it into Kiswahili. That would be great. But I, uh, coming back to the point, I think the first thing is just to allow for people who are not lawyers, who are not constitutional lawyers, to understand how do constitutions get written. That's the first uh, element. The second one is for people who are not economists, people who are not political scientists, to understand how has society evolved over the last 10 years. Um, and you know, that's why the, the conversation goes from you know, conversations about terrorism to conversations about uh, medical negligence to land grabbing in our schools to um, uh, civic education and how powerful that is in terms of this. But ultimately what I wanted to do in the book was really to provide some, I guess, vividness and some life to the kind of things that we've seen over the last 10 years. Immaculate. Conversations, conversations, conversations. You've read the book, I've read the book, we've read the book. I am saying, okay, you're a lawyer, you know all about all these things. Please, please, ladies and gentlemen, let us use this book as a springboard to a conversation about civic education. This is a case in point, and it's an admirable case in point. We're not going to argue that. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to ask you, did you know who... George Anyona was? Did you know who Wangare Madai was? Did you know what she did? Did you know that she went into the Karura forest and was, blood was drawn? Did you know that she was sort of sequestered in her house and people had to take food to feed her on a daily basis? Did you know? And I'm going to ask Irungu, why didn't you tell us in your book? So part one, did you know? And do you think that the people here in this room uh, knew about this extraordinary woman? So, um, I'll be honest, I did not know about this um, people, except maybe by just by name, 
just um, someone who I've had mentioned on these streets, Wangari Mazai. But then I think um, it's also what we do with our history as a country. I think we, we just choose to forget it or we don't value it enough, which is why I, I will tend to think that most people in this room don't know, and even if they know, just the name, not about the details, what they went through, or the struggle that they had to get us to where we are as a country. So there, Rungu, there's a, there's a target reader. I'm, I'm, I'm excited by that comment. Um, uh, what do you feel uh, you could have put in that you didn't if you did a second edition? So I, I think it's Because you name names, there are, there's a plethora of names, but the young are unaware of their significance. There are 500, a minimum 500 people uh, that are named in this book. Uh, yes. Minimum, right? Um, and I concentrate on those whose stories haven't been told. So Wangari Madai's story has been very well told. And um, when I, the stories that I do tell about Wangari Madai are really stories that are not documented yet. Um, the experience of her, um, you know, essentially um, protecting um, displaced people back in the 1990s. Um, the uh, little anecdotes that uh, I had the pleasure to experience with her um, that have not been documented. But her story is very well told. And I would argue that even George and Yona's story um, for Immaculate and, and others, it would be very easy now that you've got the name, you've got the vignette of the story, you can follow up and read up. And I think I would be really excited if people came back to me um, a couple of years from now and said, well, you know, I didn't know about Kenneth Matiba. Right? And right. I didn't know what the role he played. And I went up and read his book. And I think that, that would be great. So it's a catalyst. It's really just, an, uh, in some ways, it's just an entry point into the rich history of this country. Um, right. Christine, I'm going to go back to you. Katiba Institute, I described it as a constitutional watchdog body. Uh, so there are lots of institutions, Amnesty International, Katiba Institute, working on this safeguarding of the constitution of human rights. What do you do? And my, the way my mind is working is that I'm going to see whether there could be a synergy that brings everybody towards the same end. Okay, so I'll go back to what you had asked before, and that, was, that is on civic education. So part of our mandate is to ensure that we educate as many citizens as possible, and not only in Nairobi centric, and we try to get to every citizen as possible in different regions to understand about what the Constitution says, what it gives them, what they can use to better their lives, because our constitution is supposed to change their lives for the better, socially, politically, and economically. So what we do is not only to teach them by uh, using uh, media, whatever uh, media platforms we have, we do that also by uh, publishing books, we do that also by doing public interest litigation, and then we tell the people why we went to court, so they understand the reason why we are going to court, so that the underlying rationale can inform them of their rights and their privileges under the Constitution. But am I right in saying that your publications, once again, you hand out for free? Yes, they are meant to generally go to every person, so they, do, they are not charged because we want them to reach as far as possible. Sometimes we go and find them on River Road, uh, as in because we give them... But would the Katiba money. Institute make sure that every Kenyan had a copy of this book? Every standard eight-year-old kid had a copy of your publications. I'm saying that we're not yeah. making enough of an effort, I'm keep on grinding on this grindstone, <laughs> yes, uh, to bring everybody in, yeah. educate everybody. So or, resources are always a constraint for civil society organizations, so whatever we do is that we try to publish our books in hard copy, provide them on e-copy also so that we place them on the internet and some even tried to make apps of the books, especially books that talk about issues to do with police and police power. So we put that in the form of an app and you can download it from Play Store. So as much as possible because um, we, are, we wish we had heaps of money that we could ensure all the 47 million Kenyans had these books. But now to diversify, we just try to use different modes. And when we can't, we also use radio. And we are go and explain some of these issues on radio as well. Thank you. I'd like to, since your book is the focus, if I may, I'd like to read again from the book, to draw attention to the book, a few more passages. And uh, those who've seen the previous editions of Mbogi say, we always do this. Our focus is on the written word, the word itself. So I'm going to read some passages from the book and draw some reactions as to where the, the great Kenyan phrase, from where I sit, from where I stand, from where I, 
you know, I'm doing, I don't know, whatever I'm doing. Here's the first one, and it goes something like this. On page 16, organizations are only as effective as the individuals who work within them. In a time of profound upheaval, it is to individuals that we must look to catalyze and bring people and organizations together. So we come back, if I may start with you, Immaculate, to this idea that we as citizens all count, our vote counts, make sure on the day you go out and vote. Do you think, as a young Kenyan, that you're making an individual contribution to making our country a better place? Or do you leave it to other people? I absolutely make an effort to make this country a better place. By? By, number one, blogging. I have a blog by the name My Spacing Law. It's a WordPress blog where I talk about legal issues as well as social issues. For example, um, teenage pregnancies um, and the like, book reviews, all of that. Basically just trying to educate people and normalize some of these things that you will consider only the elite to know. Apart from that, I do run an Instagram page by the name salty.ya.mama. And there I talk about women issues. Um, for example, just what it, what it means to be a woman. That's what I do. And on Twitter, um, you can find me at, at Kadoguere. And also I'm called Feminist Lawyer. And using that platform, I try to advocate for women's rights. So that is my Okay. No favorites, Immaculate. Same question as I put to Irugu. Target audience. Who's going to feminist lawyer on a daily basis? Who do you presume might be your target audience? Similar-minded people in society. Of Those what? who are interested in advancing the feminist agenda. Advancing the feminist agenda? Yes. Right. Gentlemen, lady, would you like to add to what she said, your response to it? Yeah, I mean, I think I think immaculate for me, and uh, you know, I don't want to create you as a, as a as an object out there, but you know, immaculate for me, you represent the conscience of this country. You are the you know the generations that essentially was, you know, that is um, uh, going to keep the constitution um, you know alive. It's going to keep it safe um, over the next twenty to thirty years, right? Um, and um, for me, I wrote this book for people like you. Right, so that you would be able to connect with ancestors, you would be able to connect with uh, activists um, who were of a different generation, but nevertheless have given you the space and the opportunity to continue to make the choices that would be important for this country. So in a sense, um, for you to continue to articulate, to continue to find your voice, to, to have a sense of agency um, in terms of the Constitution, for me, is, is a way in which this country continues to grow and to deepen constitutional roots. Thank you. Uh, I still keep on the same wedge. Uh, we, we only have a limited amount of time. But let me work through these quotes from the book, because we're here to discuss the book, another segment. And uh, Christine, if you would listen very carefully to this, because the question is going to emanate from this segment. One of the criticisms of the Constitution that Irungu bears out is that there were those who were opposed to the Constitution and criticized it in these terms. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it has everything to do with the idea of creating national cohesion when you have different ethnic groups, when you have different religious groups. And somebody said of the Constitution, or in its preparedness, the Constitution doesn't meet religious moral, economic, and justice concerns. Mm -hmm. It privileges one religion over another. Mm -hmm. It allows abortion on demand. Mm -hmm. It has strong socialist tendencies. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, again, I wouldn't hold it against the person who holds those views or express them, mm -hmm. because I do think that there's a huge swathe of the Kenyan constituency that would share those sentiments. So how? are we going to create a cohesive nation where everybody feels that they are part of the process, their beliefs are safeguarded? For me, the basis of things is to start, not to look at it in terms of characterizations that may be similitist, 
because I still believe that the person who made that statement must come from an elitist, elitist uh, part of our society. What we need to do is to go to the down to the bare minimums, the things that connect us on a human level. They need, I need food, I need water, I need housing. And that we can say everybody in Kenya needs that uh, as a human being. And they're entitled to the dignity that comes with having those things. So once we identify the problems that are, we all suffer, I think is a way to bring us together. Because from those joint or common uh, problems, we are able to get into solutions that will bring us together or things that truly matter to the common manage at the very end. Not somebody who would say a middle class and to get a quote from the book, uh, for me 5,000 is to buy a, a meal out here in Java or wherever, but for somebody else 5,000 is their rent and their food for the month. They have to survive without 5,000. So if we look at the things that truly matter to the core, uh, it is the bare basic necessities of life. The uh, CKRC Commission, the one that was looking at creating the 2010 Constitution, mm -hmm. said we went to almost all villages in Kenya, and the only thing people were saying, I want a road, I want a health facility near me, I want a school. They didn't really talk so much about religion. They didn't talk about socialism, if they understood what socialism means. To them, what matters to them is that they are things that allow them to live a life of dignity for them and their children and their loved ones. So that, to me, is the common demand. Right. If you allow me to plow on in my field, we can come back. I want to go through my um, bag of tricks. Uh, Irungu, sure. I'm going to accuse you, if the accuse is the word, of at points for the young supplying insufficient information, not being elaborate enough to establish the historical context. I'm going to take, again, two quotations from the book, page 32. Daniel Arab Moy dismantled Gikuyu dominance in favor of a Kalenjin Asian tag team. Page 53, going into page 54. One of the most notorious massacres in Kenyan history took place over February 2010 to the 14th, 1984. It became known as the Wagala tragedy. Between them, the state took sides in a conflict between the Ajuran and Degodia. And then on page 55, over 3,000 people have died in 12 other massacres in over 15 counties since those four fateful days in Wagala. So you talk about a family tradition of fasting to remember all these deaths. I'm a Kenyan. I couldn't in the general knowledge quiz name the uh, 11 other massacres. Uh, um, I don't really know how uh, Daniel Arab Moy dismantled Gikuyu dominance. Why make these blanket assertions without clarifying them to the young? So one of the things I was advised not to do in the book was to put footnotes. And I have a history background. I have done a master's, I could put enough footnotes under every sentence um, in that book. Um, but I was told, don't do that, because that's not what would be an, uh, an easy read for somebody. Um, those three comments are probably the source of, I don't know, um, tens of conflict studies, tens of political economy uh, uh, you know, books and uh, theses and so on. What I wanted to establish was really what are the major themes around conflict in this country. And um, uh, the Wagala massacre remains one of the most important moments in our history in terms of how ethnic um, uh, you know, differences, um, the scramble for natural resources, and the misuse of state power can lead to just a terrible set of moments that um, have left a scar on at least two communities in this country. Um, and several years later would end up being one of the major conversations in the Truth, Reconciliation, and Justice Commission. Um, so that's essentially what it is. And again, I think it is the responsibility of people who read the book to go and find more information if they want to, um, or even to um, tweet me and say, 
could you name the other conflicts that were there? Um, and of course, that information is very much available. But I think the key thing there really is for people to get that you know, Kenya has a violent past. It has an, ethnic, uh, discriminat an ethnically discriminatory history. And that's why this constitution is just so important. It is important because it is critical that we develop an anti-discriminatory nature uh, or a culture that says it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, what your gender is, what your sexuality is even. I mean, one of the more controversial things that I notice you've skipped is really the conversation around um, same-sex um, uh, you know, relationships and uh, sexuality and our sexual orientation as, a, as an identity. Because if you ask me, that's one of the hidden stories. What's one of the, um, not even hidden, it's, it's really silenced um, stories of many, many Kenyans. Thank you. Again, I hope that when we've gone through my bag of tricks, these kinds of responses will I'll ask you to engage each other in right. what's missing and filling in the gaps. Uh, but uh, it is about the book. It is about what Irungu has written. So I hope that simply by evoking it, you're already getting some kind of idea as to the kind of book that he's written. Immaculate, corruption, the C word. Uh, and uh, again, uh, poor you the young person. There's nothing wrong with being young, I can assure you. But um, I'm going to ask you what you think might be the panacea for corruption. And there's a passage uh, in this where uh, a lawyer uh, is trying to say that they've gone to too much trouble. On page 81, a chance meeting with a tenderpreneur in the bar of the Curran Country Club in 2015 illuminated this for me. She confidently told me I should have bribed the investigative officers at the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission and Office of the Deputy Public Prosecutor. It would have been cheaper. I ended up in court and then had to find the fixers. There are fixers in all the courts. Some can ensure your hearing date is not publicly listed and others kill media stories. Some can secure delays, favorable bail terms and acquittals it just costs money, that's all. So if you are going to steal, then steal a lot. You will need that money to pay for a lawyer and the long chain of legal fixers. Does that quote make you proud to have entered the legal profession? Seems like all lawyers are a bunch of crooks. It's a repetition I found and I have found entering the, the profession, but I wouldn't want to my, associate myself with it or even to normalize it by saying, um, this is how we are, this is okay, it is not okay. And that is a fact. But then um, what I would like to say is we have normalized corruption. That is true, we have normalized it to the extent where it is a part of the procedure in a government office, in the judiciary. And I think for me, the solution lies in our, who we are as people, as individuals. At some point, we have to part from the masses. We have to part from we the people, and we have to ask ourselves, who am I in relation to the values that the Constitution has listed down? How, what do they mean to me? So I think for me, um, the solution lies in us as individuals. If I don't give a bribe, you refuse to give a bribe. The other person refuses. We break the chain, you know? the whole system collapses. And the truth is, it's hard, because what will you do? That is what people do. But then um, it's all about all of us coming together. First, as individuals, ask yourself, do you want to give a bribe? Do you not want to give a bribe? Why do you want to give a bribe? Why don't you want to give a bribe? And if we are to act in accordance to the principles that are laid down in the Constitution, then the answer is we will not want to, to give a bribe. So take personal responsibility, do not give a bribe, and the system collapses. That's what I think. Any responses to that response? Christine? No, it's, it's interesting because we have Article 10 of the Constitution is the national uh, values mm. and principles. So it means these are supposed to be things we all agree on, the values that we hold dear, and we, see, we will be guided on the basis of these values. And I think one of the conversations I've had with people before is that we put these values in the Constitution and we never even interrogate whether, whether they are actually values we all hold to be dear or, or we all think to be important. So that could be maybe the reason why we see that we reward our, our misdeeds. 
So instead of holding leaders to account, we reward uh, them with political office. So somebody has been accused of murder, oh, let's give them a political office. Somebody has been accused of corruption, let, it's okay, They'll, now it will be our turn to eat, they come to our side. So there is an issue there, and that the very core is what do we stand for, and what values guide us, because values are central to everything. Even I, am a, as a person, I have an ideology I identify with, and that ideology, or some people call it moral compass, guides my decision making. As a statement that was in the book, it's not what happens to me, but the decisions I make based on my value system. So that is what defines your character, and not true really if something that happens to me. So if we do not hold these values to be dear, and we don't think, actually, I'm entitled to a government that works for me, works for my neighbor, and ultimately secures a life of dignity, not maybe of wealth, but a life of dignity for all of us, then there's no way we can really bring corruption to an end. Because we seem to also, um, as long as it benefits me, I will engage in it, and then somewhere else I'll say it's really bad. Our country's going to the dogs. Mm -hmm. and, and we are engaging in the very same practice. Thank you. Irungu, your turn. Page 85. Mm -hmm. um, and this has got a lot to do with your, your core mandate on activism. We're talking about um, uh, whistleblowers. And Kenyan whistleblowers regularly challenge bribery, substandard public services, hate speech, domestic violence, abuse of public resources, and exclusion of those in need. To do this, they must mute that internal childhood voice in all of us that says standing up is to be a telltale, a snitch, and a betrayer. They would have had to choose loyalty to the national values of our constitution rather than their self-interest, relatives, colleagues, and ethnic group. Most times, these choices come at tremendous personal risk. So there's a tie-in with what Christine has just said about personal values, but I would like to draw you on this question of whistleblowers and the idea that whoever stands up and tells tales is in the pay of foreign masters, so that our activists are by their very nature people who stand to gain because, I don't know, I won't name names, I don't want to start a diplomatic incident, but they wouldn't be doing what they were doing if they weren't propped up by somebody else. In other words, it's also a veiled insult to the Kenyan himself. In other words, we're not keen to sort out our own problems unless somebody else pays us to do it. Yeah. As somebody who's quote unquote an insider, I'd like you to comment on that. So, so I think the, the foreign masters argument uh, was first probably introduced by Daniel Arap Moy, um, uh, former president and di dictator. And um, he tried to invalidate the idea that um, they could be Kenyans that would be passionate about uh, resolving poverty, injustice. Um, and you know, this, this was a narrative that was developed in a very conscious uh, way. And it's used by African governments and governments all over the world to essentially invalidate internal progressive um, uh, activism. What I tried to do in the book was essentially to go beyond the NGO bubble, right? And uh, it's a very conscious way of writing. I have spent 30 years working for non-governmental organizations. And if there's one thing that I've learned is that change comes first and foremost when everyday people make decisions or take, make choices to act on the things that are important to them. And that much of that energy, much of that consciousness that has produced the Constitution and has kept the Constitution alive over the last 10 years has not come from non-governmental organizations. Um, it has not come from you know, people paid um, uh, in non-governmental organizations. It's come from very basic people. I think of people like um, the head teachers that I got to know over the three years I was writing the book um, who you know, were paid very little, um, but refused to allow for the uh, playgrounds of their schools to be grabbed by uh, tenderpreneurs or by developers, um, faceless developers. And they would protect that land just so that 
the children that went to their schools would have places to play. That's the power of the activism that I've tried to capture in this book. It is not really a homage uh, to uh, NGOs. In fact, actually, the NGO story is quite muted, given the fact that that's where I've worked for the last 30 years. Um, and I think in that, I would hope that people, you know, you know, listening to us, reading the book, would see a little bit of um, what is possible when you begin to stand up and be counted on issues that are important to you. I actually believe that the battles in our lives are chosen for us. They're picked for us. Um, they're picked by people who undermine public health care. They're picked by people who um, undermine public education. They're picked by people who steal from us, right, in the, uh, uh, you know, in the guise of being public servants or uh, in the guise of being elected officials. Um, the question is really this, is do you, do I have the courage to stop this where we can? Gentlemen, ladies... There is one role that involves a comment from everybody on this panel, and maybe it is the elephant in the room. Poor animal, the elephant, but um, it just happens mm. to be big, that's all. The, what is the role of government? What is the role of government? Because the idea is that when we, the, the leaders that we always condemn in a certain way are the leaders whom we have elected. And the idea is that the light motif, the recurring wail and moan, is that we have poor leadership. It's a very glib, poor leadership on the continent, poor leadership in Kenya, poor leadership everywhere. I'd like the three of you, uh, and we'll go round so that the author goes last, maybe, uh, starting with um, Immaculate, is what role does government have in educating its citizens? Because you're doing your blog, you've written your book, you're reading your, <laughs> your... Yeah, exactly. I would say the government has the primary responsibility to ensure that citizens know their Upon rights. which it has reneged. We know that. So, okay. uh, yeah, that's, uh, I want you to, to be slightly critical. We, it, we know it's the role of government. Uh, in what way would you say it's fallen short? I think it, it rests on the fact that they have the capacity, but they're not doing it. For me, it, it goes back to um, issues, for example, corruption and the focus, and where the focus for the government is. Yeah, if you have a government and leaders that are more interested in enriching themselves, they will never care whether or not you know about the constitution. It goes back to the leadership. It goes back to what they are most interested in, their priorities, and their values as leaders, basically, yeah. Well, I'm going to be a bit unfair on you, my best friend, in the sense that if you were to become President Were of Kenya, what would you do different? What would I do different? Interesting mm. question. Yeah, and uh, well, have a different cabinet, have a cabinet that's got one Muslim, one South Asian, one Chinese, what would you do? Because if, if, if things stay the same, then, you know, we have the good old French statement there, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. What I will do different, number one, I will instill money. For, for, for starters, just don't take public resources as a personal responsibility as the president. Um, number two thing I will do different is my cabinet. Please let there be experts, not friends, not people who I'm allied to. Let there be people who are actually competent, people who you even believe yourself, you know, are, are integ integral enough to hold these positions. Immaculate. We've, we're 56 years old, 57. Uh, there's this, th th these recurring themes in our conversations that we're young nations. Africa is a young, uh, you know, at 56, are you still young? Uh, I'm I, I much, am. much older than 56, and I don't consider <laughs> myself young. So how long is it going to take? Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. That's no, okay. Think, Immaculate. Sorry think, to be unfair, dear. It's okay. I I'm a horrible think, person by nature. Okay. Um, I think it's going to take a long time. And the reason that I think it's going to take a long time is because we have normalized these vices in our society. And, and learning takes time. And I was just reading this book and reading um, Houghton's story, and he has been at this since 1980. There is no fast solution to this. We have to take time. We have to take personal responsibility. Be patient with it. 
But at the same time, even as you're being patient, do something every day to make sure that the status quo changes. Thank you. A good rebuttal to me. I'm trying to be a bit sort of aggressive there, yes. passive aggressive. Uh, Christine. Yes, so I would say democracy is not something you can say, you know, we'll do it in 10 years. It can be if it is uh, something that collectively the citizens and the leadership are working and intentionally working towards. So you will see even from our history, our democracy tends to advance a bit and it goes back uh, quite a number of steps. Then it goes forward again and then it reverses. So democracy takes a long time to entrench. And an example is America, I mean, a country which has been democratic for very long, but when one president for five years came in and it almost brought the whole house down. So democracy takes institutions, institutions based on rule of law, a culture of the people themselves respecting the rule of law and their leaders doing the same, and actually uh, accountability because our problem seems to be accountability. And once we entrench a system of impunity, then we are 56 years old or young, uh, whichever we, you look at it, but it will still seem like a, a democracy that at any turn of any one elections could almost crumble because of that kind of uh, culture that we are not cultivating, which she says will take generations, uh, I mean, a bit of a generational change. My generation, apart from, I mean, when I was reading this book, I was like, yeah, I might never know the threat of if I go to Twitter and say something and just abuse the president, I might have found myself in your house. Right now, anybody and Sandra can do that. That is a growth on that aspect of our democracy, on the right to expression. So maybe not holistically looking at it, look at it in sectoral issues and say, on this issue, we've advanced. On the issue of uh, um, LGBTI rights, I think there's also an advancement on rights on that. So we, I, in, in other words, we are on the right footing. At the very least, we have one of the best constitutions in the world, and that provides a really good uh, benchmark um, based on almost all um, recognized human rights uh, values and principles out there right now. And so it's a good benchmark, it's just that it needs to take concerted effort and a clear intention from us as well, because uh, the government will go the way the people are. If we are easy on them, they will relax. Mm -hmm. So if you are a leader and your work is to be praised, I don't think that's the right job for you. Mm -hmm. And if everybody is just saying you're the best, then they are psychophants. You need criticism to grow. And you need, we, we need to acknowledge the right things, the good things we've done, but also advise on the things you could do better. That's how democracies grow. And I would say even personalities and characters grow. Mm -hmm. Irungu, if I'm observant, it seems as if you were looking for a, a passage to so, read yourself. Yes, absolutely. You've taken my role from me. Okay, well, have a go. Let's see. It is the obligation of an author to read his own book okay. uh, from time to time. Uh, let me just let me show you one bit, John, which yes. I think kind of responds to your question. So th it's on page uh, 68, and it says, Impunity thrives not in the actions or the inactions of a state official or a public office. It grows in the ecosystem of several relationships. If power does not lie in an individual, a group of individuals, or even the state, then power can be shifted. Now, the point here, I could go on, but I think the point that I was trying to make here is that too many of us um, see power as residing in an individual, or in an office, or even in a government and a state. But the reality is that actually power is the relationships between all of these things. So that as, um, you know, as Christine says, where citizens are strong, they are informed, and they are able to hold a state accountable, that state will be accountable. Where the state is rogue, and the citizens are not prepared to challenge it, that state will be rogue. It is in the relationships that we need to look rather than the individuals. Um, so if President Were comes in in uh, a few terms from now, can I hear amen? Amen. <laughs> yes. If You're President a preacher. Were... <laughs> You're a preacher to boot. My goodness, okay. If President Immaculate Were is our president, she will still need a strong civil society. And by civil society, I don't mean NGOs. I mean that space between business and the state. Um, individuals. Uh, civic organizations, associations, professional bodies. She will need that. Otherwise, I suspect that amount of power that she wields will be her undoing 
and she too will become a rogue president. You don't have to say amen there. <laughs> <laughs> Irungu, I'm going to um, follow up on what you've just said, if I may. Sure. Uh, I was going for you in the, in the Meriga round to, to quote the example, the national example, and I may name names because he features in your book of Boniface Mwangi. Now, for those who are listening to us beyond Kenya, let me try an agitprop explanation. Activist who had taken at very many points uh, led demonstrations at political rallies and been hauled off to be sort of clobbered in police cells. And at one point, he decides to run, run for, for uh, a, uh, what, not a constituency. Why well, is uh, constituency? Yeah, yeah, constituency. Start, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and is going to um, campaign clean. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't win. Yeah. Now, that is a savage indictment of what? Because he's blown the whistle. Everybody knows he's created the brand. He's gone into uh, a metropolitan area, as in Nairobi. He hasn't gone back to his home village. But in a manner of speaking, he sort of uh, loses badly. And uh, as of last report, he says, you know, got to look after my family. I've done a lot for you guys. Now I'm in retirement. I'm off. Now, if he is the example to whom we all looked, and had more courage than I would give myself credit for. If he's given up, that makes me really despondent. What does it make you? Yeah. No, it, um, it makes me, I guess, at one level um, cautious and that um, our political system is still designed for people who are powerful, who are rich, and it doesn't matter how they made their money. Um, and I won't say anything about his uh, opposition um, or his opponents during that elections, but I think the key thing for me was the, what will remain, I think, important about Boniface Mwangi's um, attempt in 2017 was that he demonstrated that it is possible to run a transparent um, campaign. It is possible to run a, a manifesto-based campaign. And secondly, for you to rely on people to fund your campaign rather than the other way around, which is essentially people rushing at him. And for those of you who have seen the movie, uh, Softy, um, there's some wonderful moments in it where people rushed up to him and he was handing out manifesto uh, leaflets and they were saying, you know, just give me 500 shillings, give me 200 shillings. I don't think it's an indictment of um, Boniface Mwangi. I think it is a really important wake-up call to those of us who believe in a country that um, will not be governed by the 200 shilling handout. And I think that's the first thing. I, I had a moment of sadness. Um, you asked for an emotion. Um, I had a moment of sadness a couple of weeks ago when he announced that he wasn't going to be running in the elections. Why? Because I think this country has disappointed him. I think this country has prematurely aged him. And I wonder how many other Boniface Mwangis are out there that want to serve this country, want to do politics in a clean way, and now no longer see the opportunity to do that. And then the question, obviously, we must turn to is what does that mean? for a political system that runs on elections. If the demographic, the average, the, uh, I guess the median, the mean age of um, the population today is 19, right? This is, they will be the first to vote in the next elections, right? And there are about five million of them who will vote for the first time. But if they are like Boniface and do not see the opportunity to serve this country, then why do we have elections in the first place? Is our electoral system safe uh, given the levels of corruption, impunity, and exclusion that we see today. Right. Uh, uh, time is ticking. Uh, let's go back to where we began. Uh, I'll exclude the author, because obviously he has a view on this topic. Uh, what would you like to see be the future of this book in our society? What dreams and aspirations do you have for it? The dream that I have for this book is that it inspires thought, just like Mr. Irungu said. Um, and apart from that, I would love to see a deeper discussion of the issues that have been raised in this book, because I think he raises very fundamental issues, um, particularly in chapter two. And I was just telling my friend that in chapter two, I can see so many, so many issues that each actually deserve a whole chapter on its own. But as he has said, um, space is an issue and everything else. So for me, the future of this book is 
I just, I want a continuation to focus on all these very major topics that he talked about. Please, sir, I want some more. Christine, the future yeah. of this book. Yes, curiosity, as Immaculate has said, because this is not meant as an academic text, but it is, makes for easy and interesting reading. If you're interested in human rights and looking at, to look at the whole um, spectrum of the history of, 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 of how our constitution was done, how it is progressed, and now where we are in 2010, and what you can do to further the agenda um, of um, you know, a, a Kenya that we all idealize, as written in our preamble, this is the book for you. I would love actually to have this as a, a text, maybe in secondary school and even in, in, in university, because as we have all seen, it is really creates for good conversations. I can assure you, no matter what page or chapter you, uh, you, you, you open up and start reading, you'll find yourself in somewhere in these pages. Something here from these pages must have happened to you, to your parents, someone you know, someone you heard of, you will find it in these books. So this is our reality, and we need to discuss and find problems to our reality. Thank you. Um, we always end in a sort of generic fashion. I'm going to read something to you at the end, but uh, um, uh, you have less time than I primed you for. You've even got um, three questions. When do you read? You, Irungu, Houghton. When do you read? So I read all the time. Um, unfortunately, I don't read as much fiction as I used to. I read a lot more non-fiction um, now than I do. I read very intensively. I write a, a weekly column. It's 700 words, but I probably read at least 200 words um, or uh, you know, 10 or 15 different documents to produce that article every week. Um, so that's when I read, and I usually I read all the time, really. So you've also answered what do you read in, by saying, so I'll go straight to the other question is why do you write or why have you chosen to become a writer in this instance? Yeah. So I believe that, uh, so I grew up in a, in a family in which uh, we, you know, my father was a publisher, my uh, mother was a journalist, I grew up in a, a home with over 2,000 books, I recreated 1,000 books in my home and then gave them all away, I think I have now about 200 or so books on my shelf um, because I realized that actually the power of literature is, is only in the reading of literature and in the discussion. And having books on a shelf that have been read 10 or 15 years ago has no power. So I donated a lot of the books uh, with my wife to a number of organizations. But I think the, the key thing for me is I write um, to provoke, I write to um, be critical and to be constructive. And also, really, I think writing is an expression of a conscience. It is a definition of um, you know, what uh, we feel about the society that we're living in. Um, and both writers and activists are conscience car carriers, in my view. We're going to end with another reading from the book and then be prepared because uh, I'm going to ask you in theatrical fashion, because I'm a man of the theater, to uh, rise and accept the acknowledgement of our audience. And this is the... Um, last reading. Kenyans, on page 99, Kenyans demand more. They demand to know what is happening with the financing from opaque loan arrangements with the Chinese. They do not want politicians who steal from constituency development funds and then hand out unga or flour at funerals. They don't want businesses that employ hundreds of workers at minimum wage in unsafe conditions and then give to others as part of their corporate social responsibility projects. They want judges to hear cases swiftly and fairly. They want teachers who don't sell examination results for sex or money. They want NGOs that target the needy equally across 47 counties, not just Nairobi. So as we celebrate the um, happy birthday constitution, and all citizens of the world, take care of yourselves through the constitutions that you have. Thank you for watching Borgi Amaritis. And we'll have a big... Thank you. Thank you very much. From the multimedia library of the Alliance Francaise de Nairobi, till the next time,